Father, in the name of Jesus, we come at you, our Lord, saying thank you. Thank you for being so kind with your mercy, your love, and your grace. Father, as we wave through the water, my mind thought about the song that my old ancestors used to sing, what I was raised up on. Father, as I walked through that water, all I could say was, Lord, waving in the water, waving in the water, God's going to trouble the water. Father, you troubled that water for our protection. And I want to thank you, Lord. I want to thank you for bringing us through that water. And as we wade, God, you was there bringing us over to destiny. And God, you so loving, kind, and merciful. We thank you for it, Master. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Brass Band's the people's band in New Orleans right now. Yo, 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 yo. Probably a week after the hurricane, I called Benny Pete on the phone just to check on him. And, uh, you know, he said, Lee, you know, the guys are everywhere. We lost our instruments, you know, we're not gigging. We're trying to get jobs right now. 
is not what these guys should be doing. These guys should be playing music, not working, you know, in a bakery or a store. They should be playing music, you know. I talked to Benny and we decided to, to you know, we said we got to get the guys back together. in New Orleans, we do have a tip thing over here. I don't want everybody to get all excited and rush all at one time and put something in this case. Please take your time and hurry up. We're back tonight and we're in the capital city of the state of Louisiana, Baton Rouge. It's become the temporary home for thousands of refugees from the Gulf Coast. We're told 12,000 people are going to Tennessee. An estimated 20,000 are finding shelter in Arkansas. And more than 150,000 are now making their home in the state of Texas. And most of those brand new Texans, as you know, are in Houston. The mayor of Houston is now saying that the number of New Orleans people ri arriving here could actually reach 200,000 by the time this is over. When you think about the dispersal of black Americans across what now, 49 states, nearly every state in the union, even when they were received in open arms, think about Houston initially. It got kind of thick up in there. In Houston's toughest neighborhood, police on patrol, trying to stem a rising tide of violence since 150,000 evacuees arrived from New Orleans. Police here say the vast majority of hurricane evacuees are honest citizens, but a small group of violent New Orleans criminals is now fighting for a share of Houston streets. Evacuees are suspects in at least 15 murders here since September 1st. 18 murder victims had also relocated from Louisiana. What amazes me is that people said, and even among black people, well, these New Orleans folk coming down here, oh yeah, Houston was a hotbed of civic politeness uh, before they arrived here. There was no crime problem. I guess Scarface and the ghetto boys were just making all of that stuff up. Uh, never seen a man cry till I seen a man die. Yeah, I guess that was a cartoon character. The point is that there was huge uh, racial tension introduced as a result of this dispersal that very few people speak about. I don't think it would be much different if it was, you know, where, where to be people from Chicago come down to New Orleans or New Orleans um, evacuees in any other major city. There's going to be a conflict. People are used to things a certain way. So now they're out there, you know, struggling to survive. You know, I think it would be tough for, for anybody. For me to look at citizens in this country who are devastated by what happened in Katrina, thrown to the four corners of this nation, with no relationships, with no family, with no place to go, just be dropped off and then told to forage for yourself is an overwhelming experience. And they got us this place, dysfunctional families all over, can't get in touch with them. My grandmother and my uncle um, are still missing. We're still trying to find them. They're from New Orleans East. These are my stepkids. I've been raising them since then. With him, Papa. <laughs> I'm looking for my son, Arnold. I don't know where he is. Mothers separated from their children. Where's my mother? Where's my grandmother? There's no way that anybody can get records on all that. I don't know if you know what that's like to go somewhere and you don't know where your friends are. You don't know where your family is. You've lost telephone communication because the cells are down. The, the towers are down. You can't call because the numbers don't work. And it was like that for months. How do I feel about a million plus people being just thrown out of the place they've lived their whole lives? That's indescribable. I haven't got words for that. I, I never thought I'd live in a place where that could happen. And it, uh, it stuns me to this day.
We just ship over here, go over there. And um, we trying to keep some family strong here. And we, we depressed because we didn't start this situation. That's right. We stressed because we don't live in these kind of conditions. You walk around the Baton Rouge Convention Center or the Houston Astrodome, and you hear an almost uniform outcry of where's the government? How could they do this to us? George Bush doesn't care about black people. I thought Kanye West was blisteringly brilliant, even as he stumbled toward uh, his self-expression. He was nervous, after all. He's going off script. George Bush doesn't care about black people. Kanye West's comment was wonderful. <laughs> I was just like, <laughs> you can see, if you really look at it, he's like, I'm going to say something. I'm going to say something, and I'm sure he's trying to think of something eloquent and wonderful and politically astute. George Bush doesn't care about black people. When I went up to NBC, I hadn't planned to make a statement. I didn't know what I was going to do. I read what they wanted me to read, and I felt like, you know, at practice, I read the teleprompter, and I felt like it wasn't heartfelt enough. So I knew I was going to speak from my heart. Don't put me in front of the camera if you don't want me to say how I feel. And he said, George Bush doesn't care about black people. Now, the amazing thing was to turn to Mike Myers, who was sitting there like a deer caught in the headlights. Mr. Mike Myers, Dr. Evil, couldn't even utter a word, inarticulate, rendered mum and numb. After I said it, just everyone in the room was polarized. And like, it's kind of like I had to show myself to the elevator. And Mike Myers just looked at me and said, well, it is what it is. And there was a bar right across the street from here where we went to go, go have drinks right afterwards. Because it's one of those ones, you know, where you do something, you're like, oh, shit, this might be the last drink we ever have. My reaction was, A, he's, he's talking for a lot of us. A lot of us felt that Bush didn't like black people. And I was happy because in the, I've been very critical of a lot of the hip-hop artists who have said nothing relevant, in many ways have said a lot of destructive things. I thought it was a breath of fresh air that at least somebody said something constructive and stood up for their people. Well, when I was up there, I wasn't concerned about record sales. I wasn't concerned about um, sponsorships, about losing any sponsorships, which, I mean, we did. But I was more concerned about, you know, if I was in these people's shoes. I can't even remember what was what in what was there? there was a hotel right there. People who uh, follow hurricanes uh, know that the primary amount of damage from a hurricane is from the northeast quadrant. And uh, the northeast quadrant of Hurricane Katrina primarily affected Hancock and Harrison and Jackson counties in Mississippi. There was a ton of devastation along the Mississippi Gulf Coast, which a lot of times uh, seems to go unnoticed by the media. This is Second Street. Oh my God. This is Second Street. Jay had been, help, been helping me move uh, stuff out of my uh, destroyed house, and I had actually borrowed a rental van. So we were shooting some video, and we got to the train tracks, where, which are literally about 150 feet north of my house, and the MPs stop us. So they tell me, no one can cross here, quote unquote. That was their exact words. You have to turn around. They told me I had to go this alternate route, like 15 minutes out of Four the way. Four miles out of the way. And then come back to my house. So they wouldn't let us go down to my house because the vice president's going down there. Did you see that? That convoy? Yeah. Dick Cheney was down the street talking to people. So I was like, come on, Jay, let's go down there. And Jay was like, uh, I think and we're this asking. This is literally what, 150 feet from your house? Yeah. I was thinking of what I was going to say because, you know, everything that we had personally been through and we'd been hearing reports of what was going on you know, in New Orleans and everything, and uh, just how completely incompetent the response was uh, to, to this disaster. No weapons here. I remembered what he had said to Senator Leahy uh, from Vermont on the floor of the Senate uh, when he had told him to go fuck himself. So I thought it would be poetic justice if I quoted the dick to the dick. Go fuck yourself, Mr. Cheney. After I said it the first time, he kind of looked at me and everybody was like, what? And what was that? I can't believe I just heard that. And then, so I was like, well, I better say it again just to make sure they heard it. Go fuck Great. yourself. Are you getting a lot of that, Mr. Vice President? And uh, it's 
first time I've heard it. And uh, then I saw the guy who had winded me down, and I waved at him and told him to have a nice day, and I walked <laughs> back to my house. Basically, you told the vice president to go fuck himself, man, in front of about 100 media. He says it to people in Congress, and then he wants to come down here to make a photo op for himself to try to make himself look cool or whatever. This is how we feel. Look at this. House after house. Nothing. Decimation. Where was FEMA? Three days after the storm, when everybody was dying in New Orleans. It's taken him two weeks, but today the president finally ventured into the center of New Orleans for his first close-up look at this abandoned, devastated city. People here won't forget that initially he stayed on holiday while New Orleans was drowning. But the floods have already done the damage to New Orleans and to the president. Good evening. I'm speaking to you from the city of New Orleans. Nearly empty, still partly underwater, and waiting for life and hope to return. Throughout the area hit by the hurricane, we will do what it takes. We will stay as long as it takes to help citizens rebuild their communities and their lives. And all who question the future of the Crescent City need to know. There is no way to imagine America without New Orleans. And this great city will rise again. When the president came here in New Orleans, I passed my office building where I, I practice law. Lit up like a Christmas tree. I'm like, oh man, this is the power's back on. We're going to be back in business. We'll be able to, this is all right, man. I'm calling my brothers. The power's back on in our building. So the next morning, I go to the office fully expecting to be able to turn on, you know, the, the light. The lights are all off. No power. What, what happened? What happened? What happened was they needed to create a media event for the president. They wanted to make the city look like it was coming back together. And I make that point because that's, that's the game that's been played with us. It is the day-to-day -day struggles that still consume those living at ground zero of America's worst natural disaster and kept most from watching President Bush's speech from Jackson Square. He did say last night he... Uh, took responsibility took for responsibility it. Took responsibility for it. Two, three weeks into the game, it's a little late to be taking responsibility. When you're in a ship at sea and somebody screams, man overboard, you got to move and go save the man overboard. The Bush administration was, oh, a lot of people overboard. Well, let's check with the lawyers what we should do and who's going to foot the bill. What Will FEMA pay for this or will this come out of the state of Louisiana's budget? President Bush can kiss my ass. The United States government can kiss my ass. St. Bernard Parish can kiss my ass, even though there's not much left. But there's enough to kiss. The whole way the president and the Congress and the world is treating us is so frightening because it, it, it truly could kill the city. And I guess if you could kill this city, you could kill any city. And they're not doing nothing for the Katrina victims. Not the blacks anyway. I've been here in New York, be two months on the 16, and I'm still in a hotel. FEMA not doing anything for us in the Red Cross here pull out. Tens of thousands of hurricane evacuees will be forced to move once again. Now the FEMA says it will no longer foot the bill for their hotel rooms after this month. Many of them say they cannot pay for the rooms on their own. FEMA and the wee wee hours of the night put 900 people out of the hotel. I don't know if two weeks I'm going to be homeless or what I'm going to do. This is horrible. It's horrible. The aftermath to me is worth worse than the actual levees breaking because at least you know you, you've survived with your life but getting back on track it's almost like you're stuck thanksgiving was a gut-wrenching heart-wrenching situation they they most of them have had thanksgiving dinner with their families for many 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 years they have never been away from home and it just broke my heart to listen to them talking about how tough it is. Everybody crying, everybody saying, I want to go home, but I have no home to go to. They wanted to really be in New Orleans. They wanted their family members. It's Christmas holidays now. It's uh, the day after Thanksgiving. Uh, 
Black Friday, as they call it. It's black for me because that's all I see right now is black because everybody's Christmas shopping but us. Everybody's having family dinners but us. I couldn't even eat yesterday because my mom's in Texas, my sister's in New York. My family's completely, completely gone. I have my husband. I'm glad for that, but it's not the same. And I'm not leaving New Orleans, Louisiana because I was born here in 1963 on December 24th. And this is where the fuck I'm going to die at. Whether you try to drown me or I die naturally, I'm going to stay here until the end. People in New Orleans stay here. Culturally, we stay here. We don't venture further than the city. It's always uh, hard to get people to leave. I want to go back home because that's where I was born, and I wanted to stay there all my life. And I still want to visit other places, but that's my main place, New Orleans. There's a lot of people from New Orleans. We're so sick, we don't even know what to do. We don't, know, we don't even know where to go. We're so used to New Orleans, we born and raised there. Where are we going to go? You know, I mean, we, we, I mean, we, we like, you know, it's, they had the nerve to call us refugees. Tens of thousands of refugees. Refugees. For an untold number of refugees. The refugees. 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 The Astrodome is refugee ready. It's a very strange thing to see people that look like people you know, or see people that look like people in your family on television, and they're being talked about as if they're refugees or, or, or homeless people. And that was hard to take. When I heard they call us refugees, I couldn't do nothing but drop my head. Because I see I'm a United States citizen of America, call me a refugee. What kind of shit is that, man? Refugees. They were referring to when, and when this thing first happened, people leaving New Orleans. They were refugees. Damn, when the storm came in, that blew away our citizenship too. When we forgot we wasn't we weren't American citizens anymore. What kind of shit is that? In the media and people on the street. Refugees. I thought that was folks that didn't have a country, man. That didn't have anywhere. You know, it's we are calling on the media to stop calling them refugees. These are American citizens that in most cases were very viable taxpayers. And the, comp, the, the, the inference, the connotation of refugees is like they are some others from somewhere lost needing charity. I think the most shocking display of insensitivity that I saw was when Barbara Bush the former first lady, the president's mama, let's put it straight up, is touring the Houston Astrodome with her husband, former President Bush, and former President Clinton. And in the height of insensitivity, if not just outright bias, she says, well, these people are living better than they ever did. Some of them, it, it, it ended up good for them. They ended up making out all right. What I'm hearing, which is sort of scary, is they all want to stay in Texas. Everybody is so overwhelmed by the hospitality. And so many of the people in the arenas here, you know, we're, we're underprivileged anyway. This is, this is working very well for them. I mean, and Clinton says nothing. Bush says nothing. We have had black leaders denounced by the U.S. Senate for less. This woman acted like this was some kind of social upward mobility. My phone number is 504-919-8699. Tell her, call me and say that shit. Who's better off and why? How? As you say, our poor, everything I got, I got it honest. You are rich. How did you get there? Five zero four, and I ain't Mike Jones. I'm Phyllis Montana LeBlanc. Call me five zero four nine one nine eight six nine nine. New Orleans area code. My phone works now. She's the present mama of America, and that's what she thinks of the citizens of New Orleans. So you wonder why he was slow in responding? Well, if he talks to his mother, he was doing us a favor. This is such a rich country, it always has the money to do what it thinks is very important. If we want to put a man on the moon, if we want to go to Mars, we find the money. We want to fight a war in Iraq, uh, which costs billions of dollars every month, we do it. Um, you know, it's really a question of priorities and what we think is important. Martin Luther King Jr. said, don't flip a coin to me as a beggar. 
and expect that to do. That's generosity. That's charity. King said, when you're on the Jericho Road, don't just help the brother on the Jericho Road. That's good, but that's charity. He said, here's justice. Ask why it is on the Jericho Road, the guy still keeps getting mugged. Not only him, but other people. He said, pretty soon you've got to transform the Jericho Road. That's what we got to do in America. So this dispersal of black people only highlights the degree to which we failed to transform the Jericho Road. Oh, my God, this is beautiful. Kathy Phipps signed a lease on a house that means a lease on a new life. Oh, bless your soul. She's moving into a community that's embracing her with open arms. When we first met Kathy, she was a hurricane evacuee, surprised to find herself in Utah. Utah? She learned her kids made it to a shelter in Texas. Mama's right here. I'm safe and I'm alive. I'm not dead. <laughs> I'm coming to get you. And Kathy was reunited with her eight-year-old daughter and her 11-year-old son. Kathy had made a huge decision. We got him. She'd take her kids with her to the state that embraced her. The mountains of Utah are a long way from the bayous of Louisiana. Look like I done went through this hurricane and came to heaven. Heaven is a four-bedroom house on a pristine cul-de-sac in the aptly named community Pleasant Grove. Oh, this is a new beginning for me. And this is what I've really been dreaming of for my kids, you know. I think people have made a lot of money from keeping an underclass in New Orleans. And now, those people who were in that underclass are now in Atlanta and Houston and Dallas and starting to say, well, I got better opportunities here and the schools are a lot better here. My sister Catherine is relocated to Houston, Texas. Uh, it's Catherine, my mother, and my nephew, Nicholas. Um, Nicholas is nine years old, he's autistic, nonverbal. So they can't stay here because there's no hospitals in the local New Orleans East area. He's absolutely doing wonderful out there uh, with the schooling. He's getting close to starting to actually say words now, like mama or whatever. Um, but when I talk to her every day, because I talk to her and my mom every single day, seven days a week, at least five to ten times a day, um, you can hear the want, they want to come back, but there's no, there's nothing to help them to survive here. So my family is in Texas. And I'm not sure where New Orleans is going to go from here. You know, it was bad. We're, we're starting at negative 12, and I don't know how we're going to get to 3. You know, I really don't know what's going to happen. I honestly think that I'm hoping that people who had the mind to work and were trying to just uh, give themselves a better opportunity and a better situation in life, I hope that they don't come back. My Uncle James is still in Utah. He said they're giving him everything, free rent, an apartment, a new TV. My roots are tied firmly into this place. My parents and grandparents are buried here. So this is really my home. But it's hard to stay in a place that you feel that don't really want you to be here. I don't want to even be under the jurisdiction. I don't want to be under the, you know, the leadership of no one in New Orleans or Louisiana or nothing. You know, I don't think I'll ever come back. There's nothing here for me. They don't care about us here, so, you know, I got to do the next best thing for me and my family, which is move on. If they wanted us in New Orleans, they wouldn't have tried to drown us and kill us. So I'm not going back so they can finish it off. Post Katrina, I think we're doing a horrible job with respect to getting people home. It's very attractive for them to stay in those places like Houston and Atlanta and Memphis. But there comes a time where folks were like, well, wait a minute, we were just doing this out of the goodness of our hearts as Americans who care about Americans. When are you going to take care of your people? And what do you do in Louisiana, New Orleans, to bring your people home? People have been dispersed to 44 different uh, states around the United States with one-way tickets. And there's no clear discussion and debate uh, other than myself having with Washington about how we get folk back. The question I've asked FEMA over and over again, my husband has asked FEMA over and over again, why don't you give them a ticket back home? It could be a voucher, it, you know, that they can't cash it for anything else, but at least give them the option of coming back. Pre-Katrina, the murder rate uh, was approaching 200, but African-American males killing each other over this city uh, day in and day out, 
uh, four or five people getting killed sometime a night in the same house. Uh, the school system was one of the worst in the nation. Uh, our poverty rate was double that of, of every major city in the country. The wages for uh, the common man was below the national average. Uh, the wages for professionals was even below national national average. New Orleans is different only in that 67 to 70 percent of people there are African Americans and that a very large proportion of African Americans are living in a situation which is which violates in my in my terms it really violates human rights in a wealthy country like the United States. A lot of people are speculating about uh, the crime uh, returning in New Orleans and I don't think that we have there's more crime and people are pointing towards uh, the proportion of the population but what we're seeing is it's about as same as it was i think some people had that brief two three weeks where it was calm and they figured you know the bad the trash is out of the city you know the storm came and swept the trash out of the city but what they feel real federal realize is i'm trying to figure out you know why they ever imagine this new new orleans early saturday five teens were murdered in a storm of automatic weapons fire on a city street just blocks from the central business district among the dead Mona Lisa Hunter's two sons. I don't care what they say, drugs, retaliation. They didn't deserve this. Right. We've had enough. So today, an angry mayor of New Orleans asked for and got several hundred National Guard soldiers and additional state police officers to try and stem the rising tide of violence. This is our line in the sand. That's right. We are saying we're not going any further. In a city still pleading for residents to come home, the cell gets tougher when crime seems to be returning faster than people. And the African-American crime on African-Americans, particularly young black men, um, is di a direct result of the educational system, in my opinion. If you don't give young brothers the opportunity to uh, better themselves individually and then also tend to their families, um, then it's going to be continue to be a vicious cycle. This educational system was just killing the city. Uh, young brothers were dropping out in the ages of 14, 15, and 16. Uh, at a very early age, uh, they were just checking out. And then they would get into, you know, the activity that we all wish they, they never would. Breaking news, the National Guard is called into New Orleans. No, not because of Katrina, not because of national disaster, because of the crime rate. It's hard for me to imagine, after everyone surviving Katrina, now the city is being brought down by criminals, and it's so bad you have to call in the National Guard for Pete's sake? Whether crime or crime, I'm going to get mine, as Tupac said. In the city of New Orleans, no. When you have a 60% dropout rate, 55% dropout rate in the city, and a public school system, 90 of 116 schools have been deemed failures. I mean, what options do you have? We were in a system of decline because the state revenue was so low, we were not able to support our schools sufficiently to ensure that every child got a quality education. We didn't support our teachers. Our schools weren't air conditioned. Our bathrooms were unsanitary. It was dysfunctional in every single way that you could imagine it being dysfunctional. They hadn't been able to produce a, a an accurate financial statement for more than five years. They had uh, FBI agents actually stationed at the school system headquarters, which is quite the rarity. But the superintendent had decided that it was so out of control that he was just going to open the doors and let them in, have, let them have anything they wanted. We've lost children. We can't, in Orleans Parish, we've gone down to one-sixth of the previous population. So we can't fund education here at a time when it's so critical in the redevelopment of the community until we get children. And children don't come until they have a place to live and parents have a place to work. And sometimes it's like the dog wag wagging its tail. More African Americans got dispersed than whites. Uh, the issue gets to be how you bring everybody back home, give them an opportunity to get back, but to be safe, to, uh, to really fix a neighborhood so that it's safe and it's sustainable so that the schools work. Now, this is not going to be easy, and it's going to take a long time. We have to get the black people who lived here before, we had to give them back. We got to get them back. And we're not going to get them all back. But we have, we have to at least offer them a chance to get back. And by that I mean something to come back to. The roots run deep here. That there's music and food um, that are unlike any other place in the world. Very, very special. 
you don't walk away from that. Without black people, New Orleans would be a bad version of even Disneyland. I mean, the, the history and culture of New Orleans comes out of the, the, the suffering, the uh, creativity of, 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 of black people. And to have a New Orleans without black people would, would, would be to have nothing. We had social and pleasure clubs that dress out in streamers and nice suits, gator shoes with fans and dove hats and things like that. And it ain't gonna be the same. New Orleans is a cultural gem, a unique place where you can sit only in New Orleans from the cuisine, the music, the Mardi Gras Indians, the people, just the way we talk to each other. We have a patois that you don't see anywhere else. It's a very strange place, like it's great segregation and ignorance and prejudice, but it's great integration because we're Creoles. And the kind of Creole, light-skinned blacks, they were always trying to fit in somewhere. They weren't trying to be white. Like a lot of times people don't know. Creoles, they only like Creoles. This is a city with roots, families, deep, way deep. First, it starts with the whole kind of form of, of slavery that we had. And you know how the French people are. I mean, they enslaved people, but they marry them, too. The mouth of the Mississippi, man, the curve, Big Easy, you know, Crescent City. I mean, you know, I mean it's, it's a hell of a thing to have a reputation to be known for as the number one place where you can come by a nigga. It was like the Paris of, uh, of the South. It was always a center of vice and grambling and all different types of ignorance, and that always draws a lot of people who's not that interested in being prejudiced, because when you get far enough down on the bottom, hey, we all out there, brother. Tourists come to New Orleans, they go to quaint places like Little Eats, blacksmith shop. Well, Lafitte was a uh, slave pirate. At one point, the French, they had to let all the slaves go because they were starving. They was like, man, y'all go and figure out what you're going to do because we're not going to make it here. And the slaves, they all went out and, and stayed with the Native American, but they came back. Now, if you look at the tradition of the Mardi Gras Indians, they play the bamboola beat. The bass rhythm is... Shout water, oh mama. Shout water, oh mama. Mare, mare, kuri fayo. Inyare, inyare. Mare, mare, kuri fayo. Inyare, inyare. Oh, I am the big chief, the big chief, the Inyan from the nation, the whole wild creation. Oh, I won't bow down, not on the ground, because I love to hear you call my Inyan Ray. Mare, mare, kurifayo, Inyan Ray, Inyan Ray. It's such a direct correlation to your ancestry and uh, culturally significant because, you know, we, I could take you to the very spot where jazz was born, Congo Square. Congo Square was a, was a plains, a green area outside of New Orleans, and today it's, it's Armstrong Park. And it was the only place in North America where slaves could play the drums in the African tradition. Masters, in the infinite wisdom of their own hypocrisy, however you want to look at it, they decided to let enslaved Africans have Sundays off because it went in line with no work on the Sabbath for anybody. And they would dance the bombola, you know, the boom, ba, ba, boom, ba, ba, boom, ba, ba, turn it to boom. And I mean, it's right there. Mm. If you look at our, our culture, the music becomes a part of everyday life. It's not a small thing. People eat and they play music. They got songs we eat. People get out on the streets, music is connected to the dance. So there you have it. You got a great church tradition, sanctified church. Every day of my life, he's calling me. Then you
you got the French people, man, they love music. They got the French opera. You know, you could be a slave and you could go to Congo Square and you could go to the opera. Well, we was going to do that in, in the rest of the United States of America. You couldn't do that in Boston. We place a great importance on culture. And that's uh, something that you see in how we celebrate life and uh, how we even deal with death. A jazz funeral is a ceremony. It's you bring the body out to the grave and you play slow hymns and dirges. The traditional dirges like, near my God to thee, flee as a bird. And that's the mourning part. You give into your grief and you know that you won't see him again, but you just were happy to know who they were and be a part of their life. And then they say some words over the deceased out at the burial, burial site. And then you start to play the up-tempo, happy songs. You play a parade from them. And that's the celebratory part. It's the, it's the whole yin and the yang of the beginning and the end. Because, yeah, I'm sad you're gone, but damn, it sure was nice to know you. Second line is the dancers that follow the parade. And the dance that, that they do is called second line. The beautiful thing about second line is everybody has their own style. Some people just walk, some people, some people really get down, some people get on the ground, you can do what you want. You know, it's personal expression, there's a certain freedom in it. And it's one of our one of our great ceremonies. It has a lot of meanings. In the Christian tradition, how it ties in with the African tradition is that the afterlife is rich and full and the life on earth is one of travail so this person is, is dead but they're going on to riches and that's why we celebrate you know and it is also has given us the type of way to not hush over death Driving around the city, man, it, it was rough. Because this is the first time I've been back. And I talked to, you know, a good friend of mine, Wade, and, you know, he was telling me, he says, man, you got to prepare yourself. He says, you know, uh, he says, we can talk about it and you can see it on the news. He says, but cameras can't really tell you, you know, the level of devastation that you're going to see. So... You know, I was trying to prepare myself, but it still was hard, man, because I'm looking at a place that I grew up. I'm looking at homes that I used to frequent, you know, hang out with my boys, you know, and there's nothing there. It's like a ghost town. When I came back into the city, I saw complete devastation. I didn't think I would ever see anything like that in my life. It looked like someone had dropped a nuclear bomb on every part uh, possible in the city. It was as if I had walked through a time warp and I was in Europe following a bombing in World War II. Everything was great. There was no green, no flowers, no birds, no dogs, no people, no children. When we first crossed the bridge and we saw, you know, a lot of damage, we were taking pictures and going, wow, this is, oh my God. And as we came over closer to where the, you know, on the north side where the breach happened, we stopped taking pictures. Is when I saw the Lord and I saw my neighborhood, it was like looking at a friend who had been like disfigured. You know who you're talking to, you just don't recognize them. We are destroyed. I've seen Beirut, I've seen Calcutta, I've seen downtown Jakarta, I've seen Aceh. They have nothing on us. Dude, look at this. I'm telling you, nothing but destruction everywhere you look. Look at over here. Car. All of these houses are empty. Oh, sure. Yeah. How do you feel? Uptight. Yeah. Just to see all of the devastation get into the house. Look at this, is all boarded up. Yeah. This yeah. is so strange. Yesterday, coming in New Orleans, I just got so full. 
because I knew I was going to see my house for the first time. Mm -hmm. And not knowing what I'm going to see, mm -hmm. I'm just at a loss. Yeah. It's arthritis is doing so bad. Okay. Leave that in there. Okay. I'll take your time. Mm. Time. <laughs> you okay? Okay, I'll be okay. You okay? This is all stuff that can be rebuilt. What is all of this? way over here. What is that? That's the thing you gave me was over here. What is that over there? What is what? That. That's a, uh, that looks, that should look like your china closet. Your china closet don't have any business being over here. It's in the den. I know. Oh, Lord, the pictures I had in there. As soon as this picture's still up on the wall. There's nothing on the wall. Oh, Lord, have mercy. You can rebuild this stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's easier said than done. <laughs> hey, uh, 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 let's move. <laughs> oh, Lord, have mercy. Oh. Oh. oh, I knew it was devastation, but I didn't think it was this bad. <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> I didn't know how bad it was. <laughs> Today, you know, when we went into the house, that was really hard because, you know, it's like I can't go home. You know what I mean? It's, it, I'm sorry. The house in which I grew up, the only home I've really ever known, um, has now been gutted. It's a shell of what it was. 3511 Cecil Street still has a brick exterior, but the interior, which contained not just the furniture and the clothing, but all of the pictures, the family Bible, all of those things that really remind us of what our lives have been about, reminds us for where we came from. All of that has been washed away in the flood. It pissed you off because it didn't have to happen. And um, uh, I look at one of the things that made me angry last night is that uh, you know you drive around the neighborhood and you see all of these homes where people have tried to clean out their homes and all of the debris is on the sidewalk, so you can see people have a desire to come home and a desire to rebuild their lives and they can't do it you know they can't come home you know they can't get their lives back on track and you have to ask, ask yourself why I came back to nothing absolutely nothing no help no home nothing I'm 59 years old my husband is 67 years old. We've worked hard. We're well-educated. He's got a master's from US UCLA, undergrad from Berkeley. I have a law degree, an MBA, and I had nothing. I had nothing. I don't know how to make you understand the despair, the depression, the anxiety. It's like somebody violated your mama. You don't know what it's gonna feel like. Because you might always prize yourself in not having a type of dramatic emotion or, hey man, you know, death is a part of life or a kind of spiritual overview or whatever you want to call it. But it rattled me in a way that I couldn't. I guess it's kind of what people say when one of your parents dies or something. You think you know how you'll deal with it, but when it happens to you, it's not what you think it's going to be.
my population right now, what I'm seeing is that the children are losing weight or gaining weight at, I mean, huge proportions. They are not sleeping at all. They're acting out. All the children that were, like, that had ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, they're all being bumped up on all the medicines they're on because this is a post-traumatic stress disorder situation. I've been on uh, six different medications. And, Name them. Um, Seroquel, uh, Geodyne, let's see, um, Zoloft. And, um, that's the only ones I can remember right now, but those are the ones I'm on right now. Since the storm, I do not sleep without a sleeping aid. Uh, Tylenol PM, Benadryl, if it got uh, acetaminophen in it or whatever, or DIFA or whatever it is that is like a mild sedative or whatever, I have to take it every night. I've uh, never been on anxiety pills or any prescriptions for bad nerves or anything before this. I mean, I've had high stress level, but not like this. Before I got on the medication, uh, when I first got up here, I got into an incident where I hemmed a guy up and picked him up off the ground about three feet with one hand. The guy weighed about 220. And that's when I decided I really needed to get some help. People lost everything, you know, and people are really, you know, still struggling with that. And I think the emotional needs, emotionally, you know, it's, it's something that's hard to deal with, especially people that might not have the resources to go be able to go to a mental health professional, sit down and talk, or are too stubborn to. Again, we're talking about a lot of people who are too stubborn to leave in the face of a Category 5 storm. So imagine going to talk to a doctor about, you know, why you're a little more agitated, you know, or why, you know, you're in bed all day and why you're depressed. We are seeing post-traumatic stress disorders now. I think we're going to see this permeate generation to generation. Can you imagine being a child on a rooftop and watching your mama washed away and drowned? I mean, can you imagine being a mama and seeing that and people holding you back, not letting you jump in? Uh, by definition, you're, you're not going to forget that. You're going to play that over in your mind. You're going to have intrusive thoughts. There are things that are going to remind you of that 10, 15 years from now uh, because there's no closure. And it does, it catches up with you. And I find there's a lot of us who live here who, you know, we find ourselves weeping or we just find ourselves um, at inappropriate moments just, just kind of going into these very dark holes and very dark places where the things we've seen catch us and they catch us unawares and it's, it's hard to deal with. So I'm sitting there thinking, you know what, Phyllis? If you kill yourself, then you won't have to deal with this shit anymore. If you just disappear from the face of the fucking earth, the pain stops, the tears stop, and everything else that's going to bother you for the rest of your life, which is life's issues, is going to stop. And I'm thinking different ways of how I could kill myself without it even looking like it's suicide, like say accidental, so that way nobody says, oh my gosh, she punked out and the system got to her, or big brother, or whatever the hell they call them nowadays. I had a lady from Texas call me and says, I want you to know I want my brother listed as a hurricane victim. He was evacuated out, he had no medications, and he shot himself in the head in our hotel room. And you know what? She's right. That's a hurricane-related victim. Now, Dr. Minyard and I met and, and tried to come to some agreement as to what a hurricane-related death was because, again, nothing like this has ever happened. We certainly looked at some CDC criteria, Center for Disease Control criteria, but there were no criteria for something like this. In post-Katrina, there's a number of people that are dying that's related to Katrina but did not actually die within the hurricane. Uh, five weeks ago, March 28, my father passed away. Uh, 63 years old, six days before that, his wife passed away, which was 20 years his junior. She was 43. Two weeks before Katrina, my dad was diagnosed with, with lung cancer. Uh, this was a man who was, uh, started a business right here in New Orleans, Mackey Roofing, one of the largest roofing companies in the city and the state, but for the longest time, employed over 100 African-American men in the community. So to get sick during the middle of Katrina was, was actually even more sickening. We evacuated. It took us five weeks to get him back into the system. Once we got him back into the system, they didn't know who his doctors were. They didn't have any records because everything had been flooded. So it was six weeks before he could start his treatment again. His wife was taking care of him. Uh, sometime in January, we noticed that she began to lose weight. Uh, she had been diagnosed with cancer like six years ago, breast cancer, and her cancer had come back with a vengeance and spread it all over her body. Uh, there's no doubt in our minds that the stress and strain and the pain of Katrina aided to, uh, to their sickness and the recurrent of her cancer. You know, a lot of people are losing hope. The number of obituaries in the paper supposedly now is running at a rate of 30% higher pre-Katrina. People are coming back looking at this despair and dying.
And that was the pain when I had to bury my dad because everything that he built was destroyed because of the failure of the United States Army Corps of Engineers, this government, not the mayor, not the governor, but this government. My name is Kimberly Polk. I am Serena Polk's mother. Serena was here in New Orleans across the lower night ward on Tennessee Street with her father, his girlfriend, and his two kids. And she and her father and his family did not evacuate. She came to me in a dream. I woke up sweating out of my sleep. She came to me in a dream and she was saying, Mama, I'm falling, I'm falling. Mama, I'm falling. And all I could see was water that she was falling into. I think it was like April. They called me and let me know. First, I seen it on the news where I seen a little girl between the ages of six and 10 years old that they found in the lower night ward that had a backpack on her back. And Serena was known to everyone, my whole family, everybody that knew her, to have always a backpack on her back. The coroner is trying to identify a child found buried in debris in the lower ninth ward. This is the ninth body the fire department has found this month. This child could have came from anywhere. I mean, she could have, she could have floated from miles away. This is my daughter, Serena, who drowned her. <laughs> Hurricane Katrina. She was five years old. And I never got a chance to say goodbye. <laughs> and I miss her so much. I didn't want to have the service in New Orleans because I blame New Orleans for her death. The way they, they went about doing things, and I think if it would have been done a little bit different, I would feel different, but it's, it's just not, I don't think New Orleans is fit for me to live in. Oh, you know, now go, my young father. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We are going to see the King. No more dying day. We are going to see the King. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And to have been previous to command her soul to our Maker, Father, and Redeemer. And the confidence of hope for the coming again of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The resurrection of the body from the grave and the joyful life reserved. In Jesus' name, amen. This is what's left. 
you know, your, your whole history is just somewhere under a, a pile of rubble. It's really nothing. It's like you, you, you got things on your mind to remember where it was at, but when you come down here, there's, there's no landmarks or nothing to make you remember. Even where you're at, you might go up a street that you've been going up all your life and get lost because you don't know, you know, where you're at. You don't know nothing. It's sad, man. I mean, the church you went to all your life, the school you went to, a lot of the old men used to always hang out right here on the corner drinking their beer. I mean, this is a a, a, a good neighborhood that's it's gone, man. I mean, gone. possible that you can even say you check these houses to find people. Man. I mean, people coming home, going to their houses, and they still find dead people in these houses, man. Just the other day, there were five people found in the attic of a house. Who knows? Somebody might be in there right now, playing under rubble. I mean, who is, who is we to, to, to know that? But the military say they checked every house. This house here has iron bars on it, but they have numbers on the window as if it's been checked. I mean, come on, you gotta keep it real, man. I mean, they didn't go in none of these houses. That's bad, this, that, and other. But you gotta understand, baby. We need Mighty Grub for our city. This is our healing. This is how we do it. Ain't for the rest of the world. If you don't understand, that's all right. We just invite you to come down here, have a good time, do like we do. You understand? And we just want you to come and have some fun. Today is my grandfather's last day as Grand Marshal. He's right up front. He's been the Grand Marshal unopposed for about 35 years. I've come from New York to come here every year to parade with him. I am so happy that we had this celebration because it brought us all back. I saw so many people who were in California, they're in Houston, they're in Atlanta, they're in Memphis, Nashville. It was the best thing that happened to us because it let us know that New Orleans is still here and, and home is still here. We are waiting for insurance and look what FEMA did to my baby. Is this a shame or what? Nine years old, six months, look at him, old man. We're still waiting for FEMA. If they don't come, we're not going to have another Mardi Gras. I know people question whether we should have it or not, but for those people that actually came and saw it and felt it and touched it, you found out something really serious about this city, which is the city's going to live. It's got a heartbeat. It's got a soul to it that's so vibrant that you can't kill it. We got back and put it out. He 
You look around and you leave Mardi Gras in a different way. I was actually looking at the trash. You know, there's a huge buildup of trash after a parade or something, which they clean up immediately. And I, I felt the weirdest feeling. I was like, okay, when you leave this trash, you usually go into a clean area. But you leave that trash and you go to an area that looks the same. It turns out the Corps of Engineers, for some reason, is in charge of debris removal. And it took the Corps uh, probably four months before they even uh, showed up with their contractors here to start moving debris out. When you really look around, if you were to arrive today, you would think that the hurricane might have hit yesterday. Uh, but as of February 1st, what we had removed uh, debris equivalent to 25 World Trade Center disasters, and we were not at 70 percent yet. The city is still struggling, you know, outside the city limits. People are still, you know, un unsure if they can ever come back. We still haven't seen that big rally. You know, we haven't seen the three mile long, you know, caravan of, of trash trucks coming to, you know, clean up the city. I find it insulting that the streets are not even cleaned up. I'm not expecting to come back and see New Orleans as I knew it before, but I expected to see a little more progress than this. Right now we had several dogs confirm that there still is a scent of human remains in those structures. We've searched that house as extensively as we can without bringing danger to ourselves, uh, And we didn't find anything. And that's what they're doing right now. We got guys on lookout as the excavator peels the construction debris away looking for human remains. The first slash of the X signifies that a team has entered the building. Once the team exits the building, they complete the X with another slash. At the 12 o'clock position is the date that the building was searched. At the 3 o'clock position is the number of hazards found. At the at 6 o'clock position is the number of victims found. And in this case, the, the team found none. At the 9 o'clock position is the team that did the search. In this case, the Florida Task Force 1 team, which is a FEMA team. on the houses and the markings mean nothing. People are coming back home and finding corpse and uh, mummified bodies in, in their houses. So it seemed like people just walking down the street and looked at the house and said, oh, it doesn't seem like anyone is in there. It's so weird to go through my neighborhood and see the markings, nobody's nobody's, and then all of a sudden when you see that number, the shell of a house, you know, two. You know, like, wow, man. Right around the corner, two people died in this home, you know, and it's just so deafeningly quiet. My mother decided to stay in New Orleans, and I left. First time I came back was October 4th and 5th, and I, it was a few days after they opened up the city. I found out a few days earlier from getting in contact with people in the search and rescue teams that 
they had gone to the house and uh, they wrote a zero for meaning nobody was found in there. So I was thinking, oh, okay, at least she made it out. She may be sick, but she's not. She made it out. When I went to the house, all three of the doors were locked, so there was no way for them to go into the house to search the house. I had to bust through the doors. There were a few lines where you can tell the water was at between seven and eight feet. So I just searched as best I could, but I didn't find her in there. After the floodwaters let down, they were saying that people were finding their relatives and loved ones in their house and that their house had not been searched. So I called 911 and within a few minutes, some police officers showed up and they searched the house and they had in fact found my mother's body in the house. I, it was a, The initial flood certainly caused a lot of deaths, but people were dying long before that. Uh, they were dying because electricity was out, there's no respirator, uh, they, they, they were in their homes dependent on oxygen, no more oxygen, no way to get out, essentially smothered to death. People died of, of heat stroke, dehydration, uh, lack of medication, people drowned. People went up into attics and drowned there. Or, as the water rose and they couldn't get out, or I can I can just tell you I've, I've been up in those attics recovering those people, and you can tell that they took their clothes off because they were either delirious or that the heat was getting so high. Uh, they would look into the to, to the area they came up, and it was just water. So there you had this toxic sludge there at the entrance into the attic, and you had nowhere to go when the heat's getting terrifically high, 110, 120 degrees, whatever it gets. Uh, the people would try to go by the vents. And you can see the people were trying to have their faces by vents and ultimately fell back and died. She was in the, in the kitchen under the refrigerator. I think it's horrible for a family member to go home and find a body. That's, that's horrible because it was either missed in the search or overlooked or the, or the house wasn't searched or the search criteria was so stringent that they couldn't search it. You know, the, the bottom line is when you're talking to that family member, none of that matters. So many houses here, they really haven't checked yet to see what exactly is in them. This woman came down the other day and, and you know, they were just going to go out and check out her daughter's house. They had no idea. Uh, I think the woman thought that her daughter had evacuated and just hadn't been able to get in touch with her. But they went into the house, they started looking around and they found her um, in there. And that, I mean, that was yesterday. You know, it's in two or three days is the six month anniversary of the storm. I don't know if you can call it an anniversary. When the police came out and found my mother, they took a police report and said it'd take about two weeks or so. They said it wouldn't take as long because they they knew who she was and that it wasn't just somebody that they found and that I was the only other person living there with her. Um, but it turned out to take much longer than that. You, you found that body in that house, it must be my mom. Well, unfortunately, that's not true. And it's not true for several reasons. Uh, there was a lot of drift and a lot of flood and people did drift in and out. Uh, some people that ran to other houses, perhaps if you're in a one story, you ran to a two story house. Houses were moved everywhere which way. I also had people that could, there were no street signs left. So people couldn't really tell me exactly what house they came out of. The only way that they were releasing bodies at that time was with fingerprints, dental x-rays, or DNA samples. DNA testing didn't start until December. I can tell you that in September when this mission was given to me, the first thing we did was have a meeting with Louisiana State Police because our crime lab has the DNA resource. At that point in time, we knew we needed DNA, but we did not get funding and the ability to move forward on DNA until December. And you asked for it in September? We needed it in September. We were several months behind, and right now we're several months behind. From November 11th, it took till January 10th to get my mother released. This is a picture of me and my mother, Mary John L. Morant. According to the medical log, she did drown in her own home. I tell people all the time, Katrina didn't do in New Orleans, the Corps of Engineers did in New Orleans. If they had built those levees really to Category 3, 
all of the residents in New Orleans would still be here. As a child, I grew up at the lakefront, and we watched the levees go up and up. They raised them every year. And, and every time a hurricane would come, we'd go out to the levee and watch the waters lap up against the top. You know, it was fun to see how, how close to the top the waves were going to get. We never, ever thought that there would ever be a levee break. We arrived here in late September, a group of about 20 engineers in an attempt to understand what happened here. The first uh, major area that we visited was out on the 17th Street Canal. It was obvious something had happened that shouldn't have happened. And since that time, we have been working to fill in the uh, pieces of the puzzle uh, to understand what about the hurricane and what about the levees and the soils that had backgrounded what is in fact the most tragic failure of a civil engineered system in the history of the United States. This is the failed sheet pile and eye wall that failed during the hurricane itself. And then you can see right here behind me, what's left standing is the existing sheet pile from the hurricane. So it's about 20 foot, and you can imagine, this is 17 feet into the ground below sea level. The force of this water pushing against this levee, against this sheet pile, it forced this sheet pile over, and when the wall collapsed, it let the storm surge, Lake Pontchartrain, into the city itself. It was very important to us that we knew and we find out exactly why did this happen. This is one of three failures we had in and around New Orleans. The other two were on the Orleans Avenue Canal and the London Avenue Canal. One of the breaks was two blocks from my house, the London Avenue Canal. And we went there and they had some people there from the Corps of Engineers. And they were saying how the water went under the, the levee. Uh, they were only 10 feet deep. They should have been 17 feet deep. The way we actually build the flood walls here along the outfall canals is we have sheet pile driven uh, 17 feet below sea level. And then they, they are actually integrated into an earthen levee. That didn't happen. So the levees just fell down like dominoes. The only thing that we're holding these 13 feet by 25 foot slabs was a piece of plastic. I call them rubber bands. And that was in the dirt, in the levee part, which had been washed away. And you realize that that was the only security to holding those panels together. I wouldn't build a fence for my dog like that. We didn't know why these things failed. Uh, there's basically three ways. You can have water go over, you can have water go under, or you can have water go through a flood wall. There were so many breaches throughout New Orleans, and ultimately we found out there was 170 miles worth of damages. The hurricane protection system did not perform as we would have liked. The Army Corps of Engineers is under heavy fire for a report it released today, 6,000 pages long. It says in part that the work was bad. The work was humans and not an act of God was what led to this awful destruction here. We will begin here tonight with my colleague Martin Savage of our New Orleans Bureau who is with us here this evening. Martin, good evening. Good evening, Brian. This turnabout on the part of the Army Corps of Engineers, this report is a huge about face. What the Corps is saying is that the flood protection system for the city of New Orleans and southeast Louisiana was a system in name only. This is the first time that the Corps of Engineers has had to stand up and say, we had a catastrophic failure of one of our projects. The $19.7 million review pointed out details of engineering and design failures that led to Katrina's storm surge overwhelming the city's levees and flood walls. According to the report, the walls failed when the water pushed the walls enough to create a crack between them and levee soils, allowing the water to seep below the walls and push them aside. You know, somebody needs to go to jail. Somebody needs to go to jail because those levees were never really maintained the way they should have been. And now it's too late. This is the greatest engineering firm in the world. You designed a wall, which is supposed to hold back water, that you know will fall over if the water goes over the top. Now, as a lawyer, I'm sitting there thinking, are we going to have to sue the Corps of Engineers? And we find, oh, man, wait a minute. They're immune, meaning you can't sue the Corps of Engineers. The statute says the United States of America is not liable for damage from floods. The next sentence says, provided that where there is insufficient land to build a levee, 
you have to expropriate the land or you have to block, buy the flood rights. So why is there an eye wall and no levee? Well, an eye wall is something you can build on a tiny piece of ground. So here we go again. They didn't want to spend the money to buy the land to put up a levee. So they put up this chinky eye wall. And by the way, what's a levee? The levee is this earthen piece of work, four feet wide for every one foot of height. That's what holds back the water. <sighs> the levee, it's the same thing, man. I mean, they been knew that this could happen. You know what I'm saying? They knew before, when I was a child, they knew if a hurricane came through, of, you know, large mass like that, that it can happen. And I'm wondering, you know, damn, I mean, why nobody never fixed it or nobody never, and not only fixed it or made a temple, you know, just if they didn't have the money or whatever, make some noise about, hey, this could happen. You know, I ain't hear nothing about it, you know, this from the government or anyone from our town, the mayor, anyone ever say something like, you know, we need money because hurricanes always come and they're always a threat and we need help to fix this, you know. So it's like, to me, if they knew it could have happened, you know, it's almost like they let it happen. To understand the situation New Orleans is in, you've got to understand the power of the Mississippi River. As the river deposits sediment in, in the delta, you know, this creates often sandbars that block shipping channels. To get through these sandbars, the engineers built jetties that go two miles out into the Gulf of Mexico and drop all the sediment into deep water so it is no longer building up land. The main reason that New Orleans has become vulnerable to hurricanes is because the wetlands have been eroding. Those wetlands are responsible for reducing storm surges when a hurricane comes along. To expand oil and gas infrastructure, we've dredged thousands of miles of canals for pipelines, for drilling, and for navigation purposes. If you imagine in the old days, we had all these distributary channels that were kind of like the arteries in your hand. Man came along and cut off that supply. So over the last 70 years, we've starved our wetlands to death by putting a rubber band around your hand. On top of that, we have global warming, which is a very big issue. It's causing sea level to rise. It's basically making these coastal cities more vulnerable to the storm surge and the eventual flooding when these storms come. Today, the government will release its national hurricane forecast, and so far, it's not looking good. The next hurricane season is bearing down, and forecasters said today it could be a bad one. Worse than usual again. That's the prediction from every respected forecaster out there. After 24 hurricanes, and 11 making landfall in the United States in the past two years, Today's prediction for this year's Atlantic hurricane season is unsettling. 13 to 16 named storms, 8 to 10 becoming hurricanes, 4 to 6 becoming major hurricanes with winds of 111 miles per hour or higher. The research meteorologists are telling us that we're in this very active period for major hurricanes that may last at least another 10 or 20 years. That's not good news and the message is very clear. We need to be prepared. With global warming, you're now making a New York climate more like a North Carolina climate, and we know how often they get hit and how warm the waters are there. So the prospect of a severe storm hitting the D.C. to Boston Metroplex corridor is very high in the ensuing decades. When you have a storm surge from Katrina, say, of 20 feet above sea level, it's not going to help things when you have global warming throwing in an extra 12 inches on top of that. 25% of all the natural gas produced in the United States is actually produced offshore of Louisiana. 20% of all the oil produced domestically in the United States is produced off the coast of Louisiana. And it's ironic, because one of the few things in the country that environmentalists in the oil industry agree on 
is that you have to rebuild the wetlands around New Orleans. Not only to protect New Orleans, but even if New Orleans didn't exist, you would need to rebuild those wetlands to protect the production of energy. I understand in a way why they're going to abandon us. No political power, very little money, black city, uh, we can't influence much. And then I thought, but how stupid does a president and a Congress have to be to say, whoa, wait a minute, they control 30% of our oil and gas. If it doesn't come to us, our security is threatened, and $6 a gallon gasoline is there overnight. Nobody can argue that. Do you know that because these offshore oil companies go more than three miles off the coast, we don't get a dime in this state the federal government takes it all. Do you know that if Louisiana seceded from the United States and started collecting all the royalties from these oil and gas companies, we'd be like Saudi Arabia. We'd all be riding around in Bentleys. We wouldn't need anything from the United States. So we're pumping all this money into the government. We're not asking for a handout. We're asking for a little return on what we're handing out. The state of Louisiana has long been used as almost a colony or a place to extract resources uh, by the rest of the United States, particularly Texas. Um, it's extremely oil rich, has natural gas, and if you could deal with the ragged boot hill of Louisiana, it's all you have the seafood coming in, it's where the oil platforms are. But the money doesn't stay in Louisiana. The money goes out of state. It goes to anywhere else in the so-called New South but Louisiana. I mean, cities like Memphis now have you know Federal Express in their booming. And, and the Carolinas have all this banking going on. Atlanta's got Home Depot and Delta Airlines. Texas is Halliburton and other construction and oil companies glory. There's nothing left here. Up the Mississippi in the St. Paul and Minneapolis, you have at any given time about 18 Fortune 500 companies. We had one pre-Katrina Energy, and now that company's bankrupt. If they'd give us our, our percentage of oil and gas like Texas gets, New Mexico gets, Wyoming gets, Colorado gets, Alaska gets. If they give us that, we can build our own wetlands, rebuild them. We can build our Category 5 levees. We can, instead of having to cut out the neighborhoods that are our culture because we no longer can afford them, we could bring those neighborhoods back too. Give us our goddamn money. Give us our oil and gas money. We'll help ourselves. And you can kiss our ass. Governor Blanco is making good on a promise to play hardball with the federal government. Today, the state filed a lawsuit to prevent offshore oil and gas lease sales in the western Gulf of Mexico. Blanco says the sale would damage Louisiana's coastal environment. The state hopes the lawsuit forces the federal government to share profits from the sale to protect wetlands. It's about our federal government sharing the royalty revenue stream from, from the exploration and the production that occurs in our coastal waters. If we don't get significant help, Louisiana people are in danger for a very long time. I want to come home. I was born here and I always said I wanted to die here, but things been so rough. I almost had two heart attacks, had to go to hospital, but you know what? God is good. He's able, and I'm going to keep my faith. I've never seen such a time when the U.S. government turned its back on people in need to this degree. To have a people in such dire need getting such little help from the federal government while they're screaming for help, I think it's unprecedented. We need lights, water, and houses. I got a little daughter. She asks me every day, Dad, when can we go back to New Orleans? Which, which section of the city do you live in? East New Orleans. Let's get rid of all the bureaucracy. I mean, I understand. The government can go to Iraq and help people in Iraq, and we can't take care of New Orleans, and we have a problem. I need somewhere where they can put and place me and my grandkids in, because I'm living here in the Sheraton, parking $14 a day. We can't afford. We got to survive on food. You got to eat out because there's nowhere for you, no, no icebox, no stove, no nothing. So you bringing the kids out and you right. eating every day, it's $60, $60. So I need some kind of closure. That's all I'm asking for.
this was my home prior to Katrina. It was a two-story home. I've only been living in it for two years, just recently finished uh, remodeling it. This, all over here, along here, this wall here was bookshelves, my TV, my couch and everything. Um, over here was my uh, refrigerator, my stove, my sink. Up the stairs, you went up the stairs here. You go up, you went up this way. Duck your head. Duck your head, it had a low beam, yeah. And then it went up here. Probably the biggest challenge, uh, you know, we have right now is housing. Uh, there's hundreds of millions of dollars that have been raised, and we still have people out around the country still haven't gotten their first FEMA check, nor can they get a travel trailer on their home. We're still homeless. We still have nowhere to live. The lady called me because she said we have a trailer. I said, okay, I'll take it. Okay, give me an address to put it. Anywhere. Just put it somewhere so I can go live in it. Well, I'm sorry. We're going to have to put that on hold unless you are still pending. Of course, I've been pending since August 29th, bitch. I mean, I have nowhere to live. 62-year-old Florence Jackson has been waiting for help from FEMA. Where is my government? I'm so disappointed. She has called FEMA day and night and is told her application is still pending. And I want somebody to know. I'm suffering. Our idea was, man, after the storm, they would have trailers on every lawn, and you get up in the morning, wave at your neighbor coming out their trailer, and you just hear a cacophony of, like, hammers and nails all day long. We still don't have any trailers. When you fly in to New Orleans, you look across the street, and the extended parking lots, nothing but trailers just sitting there empty. Sitting there empty. In mid-January... Both New Orleans and Mississippi had asked for about 40,000 trailers from FEMA. In mid-January, Mississippi had 33,000. Louisiana had 3,000. Now, some of that is because of some internal politics in the city of New Orleans itself. But most of that is because of FEMA. You can call FEMA five times and ask them the same question and get five different answers. You're constantly going back and forth. We'll come back tomorrow. The computers are broke. Oh, we lost your application. FEMA's a disaster. We tried to get in touch with you on your cell phones, which is three quarters of the times our cell phones don't work. FEMA's a joke. We called you, you didn't respond, so that means you no longer need any help. Blah, 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 blah. You call them every couple of weeks and try and be nice. You don't want to scream at them and, you know, your, your trailer's being ordered and all that. And I finally found an apartment and uh, just called them up and told them I didn't need the trailer. And I'll be damned if the trailer didn't show up the next day. FEMA's a dirty word, so it's just a full letter word, so I just say FEMA now instead of the other nasty words. And now still, here it is six months after the storm, and there's still no help. Now, I've lost all my, every bit of information that could have proved that I own this home, that I've ever lived here. I had to, I had to put, uh, I had to get uh, duplicate copies of utility bills stating that I had utilities here, that I lived here. I had to go to the clerk of court's office and get uh, whatever information they had to say that I owned this. Then I had to go to an attorney who actually did the sale, and he had to swear on, I had to swear on an affidavit that I, I owned this. Who the hell goes through that? Who goes through that crap? I mean, my God, this is, would I come here and say I own this if I didn't? You know, we need help. Look, see these little pink flags, these little orange flags here? I have been marked for a FEMA trailer. I'm still waiting for a FEMA trailer. Six months. Six months. People got trailers over on that side. Give us a trailer. Look how big this yard is. Give us a little raggedy trailer, you know. Well, we don't need a, f a few of them for the hour. <laughs> you know, but the yard big enough, you know, you got the sewer right there. It's big enough for like about four good trailers. That we're the people in the block, I can call and they can come home. That is my FEMA trailer right there. I still have no power. I do have water and I do have sewage. And I have a toilet that I can sit on rather than a five-gallon bucket. When is the power coming? Um, whenever I decide to give somebody a blowjob, I guess. <laughs> Why you say that? Because that's the way I look at it. When you get a FEMA trailer, which I'm fortunate to have one, and most people in this neighborhood that have one, I would say 1% of them are usable. They don't have electricity connected to them. And... And I've called city councilmen, 
my senators, Jay Blossman, I left a message with the Pope even. And I'm thinking that may, may be the answer. We're here in my FEMA condo trailer. It took us, uh, we put in for it in December. And we got it, I think, one, two, three, about four months later, which is really not a long time to wait. Because, I mean, there were people that waited, you know, longer than that. So four months really wasn't that long, but it was long enough. We've been in here two months. Um, it's not bad, but we had a couple of mild thunderstorms last week, and, and it's not too stable. I mean, it's sitting on bricks. So light winds or mild to strong winds are kind of like run for your life shit. But we do have a house in the back of us in case we need to run out of here and run into a solid foundation. Me and my father have been living here since about um, December. Come on, I'll take, take you on a tour of the FEMA trailer. Yeah. It's so well made. There you go. Luxurious, spacious cabinets. One of the doors to separate the room, you know. It used to stick up here, but now we just have it held on with like safety pins and twine. This is the, the dining room table, you know. It's not very well built, you know. It just comes, comes apart. And, you know, this is um bed. Bed area is where I sleep, it's, you know. I'll show you the view. Look! Another FEMA trailer? It's straight bullshit. These people have been sitting out here for nine months. I think these politicians forget who they work for. They work for the people. They think it's about themselves. There's no reason in the world we should have this. Louisiana is still ass backwards and we still have people who are scattered to the wind and don't understand what's next or what's coming next or where to even find it at. So it's a lot of bullshit, man. It's a lot of bullshit and it's time for the politicians to quit the bullshit and understand who they work for. I don't care who you are. I don't care what color you are. You can be orange. You got to remember who you work for and you're working on the backs of poor people who work every day, pay their taxes, and everybody ain't looking for welfare. People are working and working two and three jobs. And these fools running around here, they don't know their head, they don't know four dogs got four assholes. Can we move on to something else? Because this, this is not working for me. Fuck. I think that this is a great moment in American history. Because I feel that in this moment, we see a lot of what's wrong with us. It's a signature moment. It's like sometimes you walk past the mirror and you see yourself in a, in a position you don't like. Damn, man, I, know I, was, I thought I was 10 pounds of weight. I'm 50. Well, this is like you stayed in front of the mirror and you couldn't turn away from it. You stayed in that pose, and everything in that pose shows us what's wrong with us. I'm here today because Louisiana needs your help. Most homeowners' policies will not pay flood losses. We have an estimated 20 to 30 billion dollars in uninsured losses. If Congress fails to help, our people will have no money to rebuild. The first lawsuit we filed was the insurance lawsuit. And uh, uh, that was born out of the idea that most of the insurance companies we knew in advance were not going to want to pay the claims. And as an aside, you know, 20 years ago, there weren't many exclusions. As time goes by, after the big Cold War, they started putting in, we're not going to pay for nuclear war. Then they said they weren't going to pay for asbestos. Then they said they're not going to pay for lead. Then they said they're not going to pay for pollution. And now they have something called, they're not going to pay for, water damage. In Mississippi today, the opening moves in a landmark lawsuit that pits victims of Hurricane Katrina against their insurance companies. As you may know, this is a hot issue in the storm zone. The question at the heart of this is whether water damage from Katrina is classified as hurricane damage or flood damage. The stakes here are huge. $75 billion in flood and storm surge damage was reported in 1.7 million claims. I was told by my agent that I had a policy that would protect me for hurricanes because I asked specifically for that. 
But Nationwide Mutual concluded that most of the damage was caused by flooding, and because Leonard did not have a separate flood insurance policy, denied most of his claims. We think the facts clearly show that the coverage that the Leonards purchased did not cover flood, but the damage was primarily flood. This groundbreaking trial over wind versus water damage and which policy covers what could affect thousands of other families along the Gulf Coast who were denied their insurance claims and have also filed suit. Insurance companies are another joke. I mean, you pay your premiums. Don't ever be late paying an insurance premium. And then you say, well, I'm covered. I've got flood insurance. I've got wind insurance. I've got loss of use. I've got loss of income. Oh, insurance companies. Insurance companies has been playing hell with me the whole frickin' time. The argument could be made, which came first, the chicken or the egg. I think it rained before the levees broke. So it's quite possible that your house was flooded if you had no roof before the levees broke on Monday evening. And the insurance carriers are not honoring their promise to cover you. Those good hands people and the good neighbor people, I don't believe anything they see because they're the worst offenders. My street, it's like a ghost town, nobody's here. It's hard to see a neighborhood so full of life without any life in it anymore. My father, I knew it was going to be hardest for him. He came back from World War II, took his $10 to hold that contract, it took all 30 years to pay that $13,000 for that house. And he had broken his leg, so he was shuffling around the car. And then he turned, and he saw the house, and he just broke down. You know, he said, my whole life. And that's the moment that uh, I'll always remember because to see, uh, to see my father, you know, in his 80th year of life, go through uh, his darkest hour, was hard. This is it. This is my childhood home, totally wiped out. By Katrina. I could care less about the house almost. It's just the fact that, you know, I saw this young man, young black man, come back from World War II and take his last $10. I, he always talked about the day he bought the house, you know. He came back to my mother and said, I, I bought a house today for $10, the whole contract. So for him, he said, I, I, had, a, I had all my sons in this house. So, yeah. Insurance companies are there's a special, special circle in hell for them. Man. Dante would, 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 would promote them to a very special place in hell because, um, it, it, you know, you sit there, you see everything damaged, and they just come up with any way to say, I'm not going to pay you. So luckily we have flood insurance, but the way they sell it is, you know, you have homeowner's insurance. To get a little flood insurance, I mean, between the two you'll be made whole. But when it came to it, it was just flood insurance. Thankfully we had a little bit, but it was like maybe 40, 50 percent of the value of the house. And then they said, well, we'll give you wind on your homeowner's insurance above the water line. And then they came back and said, well, everything above the water line was damaged from the flood anyway. We're not going to cover that. I said, well, we had $12,000 insurance on the shed in the backyard. They said, there's a tree falling on it, totally destroyed. They came back and said, well, it's repairable. So we're only going to give you 25% of that. And then we're going to take the deductible or the full value of the house, and your check for $670 is in the mail, along with the check for $400 for the time you were out. You know, it was 10 days, $40 a day, so it's in the mail. So thank you very much. My father's hard of hearing. So the adjuster was there, and as he was leaving, he goes, hey, man, my father, you know, I, I, I can't hear, but I just want you to be fair. Be fair with me. You know, and the guy had already told us, you know, I'm not paying you anything. So the guy turns his beat red and he goes, you know, just be fair. Thank you, you know. So we drive 70 miles to Baton Rouge. I said, wait until we get to Baton Rouge to tell daddy. So we say, listen, uh, I said, really, we got to explain to you, you know, insurance company's not going to pay you anything. You know, you are not in good hands. 
you know, with Allstate. You done. My father said, what? Nah, man. I've been paying them people for 50 years. Nah. I said, no, daddy, not giving He said, what? He said, man, don't tell me that, man. I would, why you didn't tell me in New Orleans? I would have killed that man. I said, that's why I didn't tell you. The master plan for New Orleans is to bulldoze down the Ninth Ward. The Ninth Ward is a place of uh, predominantly black people. And you got these land grabbers down there, the Trump land grabbers, who want to go down there and buy up all the land and, you know, regentrification. You know how that goes. And, and urban renewal, in the name of those things, take this place and change it. People basically are being told, what you have is of no value. We won't have an opportunity for the intergenerational transfer of wealth, of property, of assets from one generation to the next. And this is particularly affecting African-American communities in New Orleans. As soon as the planning process is done, which I say to you, should have been done by now. Other communities that have been devastated along the coast have already done that. So that people can make their own individual property decisions based on fact. This is 2310 Delory Street, and these are the three lots that my grandparents bought in the late, like in 1949, to build their dream house. When we came down, my sister and I snuck in, and we were looking left, looking for the house. We were like, do you see it? Did it move? Did it crush? What happened? We didn't see the house, and that's kind of odd because the house was really big. I want you to know this. The persons who live in the lower nine, they were homeowners. I was a homeowner. 35 years I worked to pay for the property that I own, plus my rentals. Not only that, I paid my tax bill. I got the tax bill in December, and I paid it January, before January 31st. And on the back of that, it said police and school, and now I can't even get a school open in the lower nine. This is what's left of the house. Uh, the house actually lifted and floated across the street over here. And we were like, oh my God, I don't know how I'm going to break this to my grandmother, that, that house that she loves so much that my grandfather built is like, you know, at this point, you know, uh, you know it's not going to make it. What really bothered me was this risk building at my own risk. Do you know, I just want to call this to your attention, attention, the geography. New Orleans is surrounded by water. If you go north, it's the Pontchartrain Lake. If you go west, it's the Bunny Carry Spillway. If you go south, it's the Mississippi River. And if you go east, you got Lake Bourne and all of the little tributaries and the wetlands out there. So who's at risk? And I, you know, pulled my grandmother to the side and I said, you know, Nee, listen, sit down. We have to tell you what's going on. Um, and, you know, she says, what's going on? I said, well, the house is gone. It moved. And she said, what do you mean the house moved? I said, the house, it's floated across the street. And, you know, and I said, I don't think, I said it was kind of tilted, tilted, so I don't think that it's going to make it. I don't think it's going to stand. So, you know, and she said, where is it? I said, I don't know. I think it's in Mr. Johnny's yard. I couldn't see from where I was, and Mr. Johnny's yard is down there, but I thought it was in his yard. But I really couldn't tell. I said, well, I think it's in Mr. Johnny's yard. And my grandmother just paused for a second, and she sits down. And she looks up at me, and she says, well... Johnny Kane never signed, gave him nothing. I gave him a whole house. And I thought, oh, God. I mean, we're standing there nervous and laughing because we're, like, relieved that she didn't fall to pieces. New Orleanians and Louisianians are resilient people. And so they're going to find a way to come back home. I'm telling everybody, hold tight. Don't give up your property for anything. We fought too long to get our property. So even if you don't do anything with it, gut it and sit on it. Everybody knew property value in the Ninth Ward was going up. And when this disaster happened, they went... Here's our opportunity. So developers are now getting in bed with politicians to come, with all, come up with all these schemes to take people's land. Nine months after Katrina, and the lower nine still looks like a bomb hit it. I think that, you know, it's meant to discourage the neighbors from coming back. I mean, most people have lived in the lower ninth ward with a, with a, a solid, um, you know, thought in the back of their minds that straight up, we're not wanted here in some way, shape, form, fashion. 
that this, this area could be used for industrial purposes. We live on a waterway. There are a lot of companies who could use this area for industrial purposes, warehousing and things like that. And so a lot of people have always felt like that's been like the goal, you know, for a long time. But most of the lower niners that I talk to are like, hell no, you're not going to take anything from me. And you're not going to run us off like that. You know, you're not going to just shoo us away. The people trying to buy us out. I'm not going nowhere. I'm keeping my little raggedy house. I'm going to stay right there and get me some sheet rock and I'm going to be there. Now, they can come visit me if they want, but I'll be right there on their front porch waving at people when they pay like I always do. How y'all doing? We're probably going to end up a small city, gentrified, primarily white, primarily well-to-do. And I think the rest of the United States, that's just fine. I have publicly said, and I will continue to say, we plan to rebuild every area of this city, including the Ninth Ward, and we're going to do it, regardless of if there's a small group of people that may have other plans and other agendas. New Orleans is not New Orleans without the mix of people that were here before, and it would not be the kind of city that I think most people uh, would treasure. But it's all predicated upon what the Corps of Engineers is going to do as it relates to levee protection. June 1 is a very significant date to the people of New Orleans. It's the beginning of the next hurricane season. And Task Force Guardian, uh, the Corps of Engineers, we are trying to make these repairs to provide a level of protection that existed prior to Katrina before the hurricane season starts. The Army Corps of Engineers has been promising the people they would have the levees back to pre-Katrina conditions prior to the 1st of June. When we heard that, uh, a cold chill ran down our back because we knew pre-Katrina conditions were not okay. New Orleans, as of the beginning of the hurricane season, 06, has Lego levees. I mean, these things will crumble um, with a strong wind. Our obligation to the public is to base our conclusions on science, on facts, on engineering, and tell the truth. Do I trust them? No. They knew those levees had issues 10, 15 years ago. The Corps of Engineers knew it. The federal government knew it. The state government knew it. The city government knew it. And they turned their head. We've been honest with the public, and we have to tell them, look at what we're building. It's stronger than what you had before. I want to caution all residents that after much pro probing and questioning, the Army Corps of Engineers has warned me that some of our lowest lying areas of New Orleans East and the Lower Ninth Ward will have some flooding from levees overtopping if another hurricane travels along the same path as Katrina. The fact of the matter is that no one really takes it very seriously. All right, they just, they just it's, we're going to put a little paste on it, we'll put a little band-aid, and we're going to deal with it that way. And the reason why they're doing that is because our president sees us as not quite much of a threat. You know, Louisiana, I'm going to get them anyway, because they're they, they buying my bullshit. So why should I spend billions of dollars fixing these levees, given the political environment that we're in? We need a different government. We need somebody in there that actually, really and truly cares about the people, about their property, about their homes. You know, somebody who really and truly cares. But who's it going to be? After Katrina, I had the opportunity to go to the Netherlands to look at their defense system. And I was actually embarrassed to talk about ours when you look at their system. Number one, they build substantial levees and they armor them. They protect them from waves and overtopping and all the problems we saw at Katrina. But more importantly, this is a very small country. It's 14 million people. 65% of the Netherlands is below sea level. But they have the will to go out and build high enough and strong enough to withstand a 1 in 10,000 year storm surge event. We can do the kinds of things that Dutch engineers have done, and in fact, we, we should learn from them. Um, but we haven't mobilized the will. The Army Corps of Engineers had 40 years to build a protective system around the city of New Orleans. The hurricane hits August 29th. It takes them approximately eight weeks to two months to drain the water out. So you mean to tell me they're going to repair what they couldn't build in 40 years? They're going to repair it in, in eight months or 10 months? to be up to a point where people should feel secure? I would caution people to um, not be deluded, to go uh, forward um, in a, 
in a way that they understand, uh, not to buy promises that could be false promises, uh, because it could mean that they could lose their lives and their homes again. With the tropics heating up, the work at the 17th Street Canal can't move quickly enough. The gates are in place, but the pumps still aren't operational. New delays make old deadlines dicey. Unfortunately, to a large degree, our fate is in the Corps' hands. The Corps is now blaming rain and not enough working space, and they say residents need to keep their guard up. But I do believe that they should be concerned because, uh, you know, we don't know what kind of uh, hurricane event we could see in, in, in this year. With the temporary pumps on the bridge, the Corps can pump less than 15 percent of the canal's capacity if it needs to close the gates. The Corps says it's getting little sleep, too, having put in place a billion dollars worth of flood protection since Katrina, a work still in progress. What's going to happen when the hurricane season comes? We're screwed. They don't have to tell me 19 hours anymore, because if it's predicted on Monday, I'm leaving Friday. I'll admit, I'm scared. You don't know what's going to happen. Be prepared to run and have your place to run to. If someone came to you, has a house that's near the lake or a levee or a flood wall. It says, it is safe for me to move back in. <laughs> is it safe? You remember the marathon, man? Oh, I remember. Um, so long as it's living Yep. Is it safe? The answer is no, it's not safe. Not just the levees broke, the spirit broke, my spirit broke, the families broke apart. I want my mama back, I want my sister back, I want my nephew back. The auction block broke from so many African American bodies. The sense of direction was broken because of the darkness. There was light from time to time, but they broke away and left us. My being together broke when I fell apart. The smell broke away from my skin when I came out of the waters. The waters that came and stood still with the bodies of my people, the dogs, shit, piss, rats, snakes, and heard of alligators. The broken smiles, the broken minds, the broken lives. And you know something? Out of all of this brokenness, I have begun to mend. With God and my deep, deep commitment to infinite strength to never give up, I am mending. I am coming back, God willing, for a long, long time. So when you see the waters, when you see the levees breaking, know what they really broke along with them. Hallelujah. Ah, my way. When you 
you were born in this and your first breath when the doctor slaps you is tinted with magnolia blossoms and you know you drink Mississippi River tap water in your first formula, it's a thing that you won't find anywhere else and folks who had to evacuate know you might go somewhere and you might have a good time but it's nothing like home and when you can call New Orleans, Louisiana home, baby you know what it means to miss New Orleans, trust me. Darlene Acevedo, born in New Orleans, Louisiana. Jay Acevedo, born in New Orleans, Louisiana. Shelton Shakespeare Alexander, St. Bernard Parish, Violet, Louisiana. Lee Arnold, tour manager for New Orleans' own Hot A Brass Band. My name is Graylin Bryant Banks, born and raised in New Orleans, uptown in the 13th Ward. I'm the director of safety and loss prevention at the Hyatt Regency, New Orleans at Louisiana Superdome. John Barry, author of Rising Tide, The Great Mississippi Flood of 1927 and How It Changed America. I'm Professor Robert B, University of California at Berkeley, Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Actor, activist, Harry Belafonte. I'm Wilhelmina Blanchett, I'm Terrence's mother. And I'm Terrence Blanchett, and we're both born and raised here in New Orleans, Louisiana. I'm Kathleen Babineau Blanco, Governor of the State of Louisiana. Douglas Brinkley, American historian. Joseph Bruno, I live in a section of the city called Carrollton, and I'm a trial lawyer. State Representative Karen Carter, District 93, New Orleans. I'm Dr. Louis Cataldi, I'm the State Medical Examiner for the State of Louisiana. Judith Morgan, Wyklosky, St. Bernard, Louisiana. Cheryl Livides, Wyklosky, St. Bernard, Louisiana. Will Chittenden, born and raised in New Orleans, Lower Ninth, St. Bernard Projects. Eddie Compass, former superintendent of New Orleans Police Department. How you doing? I'm Harry Swamp Thing Cook, and I'm the bass drummer for the Hot E Brass Band. Sarah Dean, St. Rock, New Orleans. Petri Laudemar, St. Rock, New Orleans. Emile Dumenil from the Lower Ninth Ward, New Orleans, Louisiana. Michael Eric Dyson, author of Come Hella High Water, Hurricane Katrina and the Color of Disaster, professor at the University of Pennsylvania. My name is Felton Earls. I'm professor of social medicine at Harvard Medical School and professor of human behavior and development at the Harvard School of Public Health. I'm Paris Irvin. I'm a resident of New Orleans. My name's Sylvester Francis. I was born and raised in New Orleans, Louisiana. My name is Herbert J. Freeman, Jr. I was born in Northern Louisiana in the Garden District. Dale Gerard Gentilly, New Orleans, Louisiana. My name is Luella Givens, and I'm a lawyer in Orleans Parish. Anita Gupta, assistant counsel at the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. My name is Glenn Hall. I am 10 years old, and I play the trumpet. I'm Tanya Harris from the Lower Ninth Ward. I'm Josephine Butler from the Lower Ninth Ward. Donald Harrison, jazz musician from Uptown New Orleans. Danielle Harrington, born and raised in New Orleans, Louisiana. Dr. Corey Hebert, pediatrician, New Orleans, Louisiana. Damon Hewitt. Assistant Counsel, NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, and a native of New Orleans. Freddie Hicks, New Orleans, Louisiana. Justin Height, Berkeley, California, Common Ground in the Lower Ninth Ward. Fred Johnson, born in New Orleans, Louisiana. I'm Michael Katz, Walter H. Annenberg Professor of History at the University of Pennsylvania. Michael Knight, Lower Ninth Ward. Mitch Landry, Lieutenant Governor, State of Louisiana. My name is Mrs. Phyllis Montana LeBlanc, born and raised in New Orleans. Tremaine Lee, staff writer, New Orleans Times Picayune, from South Jersey. Brendan Lloyd, blogger and hurricane buff, irishtrojan.com. Dr. Calvin Mackey, professor of mechanical engineering at Tulane University, member of the Louisiana Recovery Authority, born in the 7th Ward in New Orleans, Louisiana. I'm Dr. Ben Marble. I'm an emergency room physician along the Mississippi Gulf Coast, and I live in Long Beach, Mississippi. Quentin Marcellus, Pigeon Town, New Orleans, Louisiana. Kevin A. E. Martin. Pumping power plant operator, 
Mel from Mean Papa Station Number One, New Orleans, Louisiana. My name is Hassan Mashriki. I'm an assistant professor at Louisiana State University Hurricane Center. I'm Mother Audrey Mason from New Orleans, born and raised 63 years. Betty McHale and Charles McHale, Three Park Island, City of New Orleans. I'm David Meek, city editor of the Times Picayune in New Orleans. Yes, my name is Joseph Maloso from New Orleans, Louisiana. I'm from the third world, which is called the Magnolia Project. Gina Montana, Mid City, New Orleans, Louisiana. Henry Morgan, St. Bernard, Louisiana. I'm Mark Morial, former mayor of New Orleans, a son of New Orleans, and now the president of the National Urban League. My name is Cynthia Hedge Morrell. I'm the newly elected council person from District D, New Orleans, Louisiana, born and raised. I am Arthur Morrell, state representative from District 97 in New Orleans, Louisiana. I was born and raised in New Orleans. My name is Joyce Lynn Moses. My name is Anthony Dunn. And we both are residents of New Orleans. We've been here all our life. Ray Nagin, mayor of the city of New Orleans. My name is Linda Novak, and I live in Holy Cross, Lower Ninth Ward. Soledad O'Brien, co-anchor of CNN American Morning. Sean Penn. My name is Benny Pete, and I'm the tuba player for the Hot 8 Brass Band. Wendell Pierce, born in Pontchartrain Park, New Orleans. Kimberly Polk. I live in the Bywater community of New Orleans, Louisiana. Pastor James Pullings, Jr. of the Leviticus Church of God in Christ, Queens, New York. Garland Robinette, WWL Radio, New Orleans, Louisiana. Robert Rock, born and raised in New Orleans, Louisiana. Junior Rodriguez, St. Bernard Parish President. Dana Salney, born and raised in New Orleans, Louisiana, 7th Ward. Michael Scott Schlachter, I am the founder and chief meteorologist of Weather 2000 in New York City. Jeffrey David Schultz, chief climatologist at Weather 2000. Jay Scully, Long Beach, Mississippi. Mike Seelig, Uptown, New Orleans. I am Colonel Lewis Setliff, Commander, Task Force Guardian, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, here in New Orleans, Louisiana. I'm Reverend Al Shopton, President of National Action Network. Brian Tevino, Staff Writer at the Times Picayune. I live in Uptown, New Orleans, Louisiana. Charlie Valley, photojournalist, citizen of the world, New Orleans, Louisiana. I'm Van Heerden. Deputy Director of the Louisiana State University Hurricane Center. My name is Elder William Walker, Jr., pastor of the Noah's Ark Missionary Baptist Church, located in Central City, New Orleans, Louisiana. Rhonda Washington, registered nurse, high-risk OBGYN, University Hospital. Kanye West, artist. Roy Williams, director, Louis Armstrong, New Orleans International Airport. This time I'm walking to New Orleans. I'm walking to New Orleans. I'm gonna need to parachute when I get through walking the blue. When I get back to New Orleans, I've got my suitcase in my hand. I'm leaving here today Yes, I'm going back home to stay Yes, I'm walking to New Orleans You used to be my honey Till you spent all my money No use for you to cry I see you by and by Till I'm walking to New Orleans I've got no time for talking I've got to keep on walking New Orleans is my home That's the reason why I'm gone Yes, I'm walking to New Orleans Thank you.